that uh, you would be pleased with our worship. Lord, bless us as we continue in our worship service and hear from your word. Lord, may the lips that proceed out of my mouth, may the words that proceed out of my mouth, uh, Lord, be your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So if you see my lips falling off of my mouth, okay, I, I you know, I, since, since, we've, since we've now gone there, I have to tell you that um, I really can't be held responsible for anything this morning. Uh, last night as we were visiting with family and family, uh, Shelly says, hey, does anybody want some coffee? I'll make a pot of decaf. Because any time after like about 6 o'clock at night, if I drink caffeine, I don't sleep too well. So she goes and she makes a pot of coffee. And we're out there. We're sitting on the front porch visiting. And after we all have our coffee gone, Shelly gasps and says, oh, oh. No, I think I made regular coffee. <laughs> so anyway, um, Karen, were you up all night? Till two? Okay. But anyway, uh, life is good and, and I love my wife and if that's the worst thing that ever happens, we'll all be in good shape. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter two. And uh, we're going to just continue right on and I better turn my little gizmo on. Randy's looking at me that way. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to continue right on in these messages to the churches. Um, last week we looked at the message to the church at Ephesus and we decided that, that we certainly don't want to fall into the same trap that they had fallen into. Uh, they were busy. They were doing all kinds of good things, but the Bible says that they had forsaken their first love and they had uh, gotten away from loving Christ and, and letting the love of Jesus be their motivation for what it was that they were doing. And, and so we talked about not wanting to fall into that pattern of just doing rituals and, and things like that. And so today uh, we're going to read about a church in Smyrna. And uh, this would be called, if some of you have the New King James Bible, your subheading probably reads, The Persecuted Church. Uh, this is the church that was going to be going through a tremendous difficulty. So let's read the scripture and see what we can find in it here that the Lord might say to us. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. So we know just by that verse, we know that these are whose words? Who? The words of Jesus. How many of you have the red letter editions of the Bible? Your words are in red, aren't they? Okay. This is Jesus Christ as he is uh, revealing his revelation to John on the island of Patmos. And so now Jesus is... Uh, saying, look, these are my words. I am the first and the last. I am the one who they crucified on the cross. They buried me in a tomb and I have risen again. I am alive and well. Praise God that we serve a Savior that is alive and well. But that's who it is that we're hearing from here. And so verse 9, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Yet, he says, you are rich. Now, how can somebody be in poverty and yet at the same time be rich? How is that possible? Well, what he was speaking of is at this particular time, uh, Smyrna was in the main hubbub, if you will, of, of the port towns and the, the highly traveled area where the merchants went. And, and most of the folks in Smyrna were very wealthy. In fact, they were very prideful of the fact that they were so successful and they were very wealthy. The church, however, in Smyrna 
uh, didn't connect too well. They were having some of the same problems that Christ himself had. The Jews didn't want any part of the church being there and the church being successful. And so from a monetary or, a, if you will, a, a worldly wealth perspective, this particular church was very, very poor and, and very uh, destitute, if you will. But Jesus said, yet yeah, you are rich. What's he talking about? He says, you're rich because you have the true experience with the Lord. You have salvation. You are a child of the King. You have eternal life in a real place called heaven where the streets are paved with gold. That's what you have a hold of. And so he said, in the midst of your great poverty, as the world may see poverty, you are rich. And he goes on and he says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay? And, and so what we have to understand here is it, who were the main people responsible for crucifying Christ? Who was it? The Jewish leaders. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay? Well, these same, quote, Jewish people, Jewish leaders... They're still not buying into this whole Jesus thing. They're still not uh, wanting to get on board. And so what, what Jesus is now saying, and, and by the way, if Jesus were alive today, I still think that uh, he would not be any more politically correct than what he is when he wrote this. I mean, uh, can you just see the front page of the news? Yeah, religious leader calls Jews synagogue of Satan. I don't think that would fly too well. You know what I'm saying. But, but Jesus is saying, look, they're, they're not truly Jews. They're not truly my people. They're of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, they, they have fallen for lies and things that are not true. And if they really believed in me, if they really truly understood the scriptures, because it, it, all throughout the Old Testament, the prophecies are there in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Psalms. There's so many messianic prophecies. Jesus was talked about and he said, look, they are not real Jews. They are of the synagogue of Satan. And they were about ready to persecute this particular church. In fact, in verse 10, he says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you that the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Now how many of you have ever heard of a real live person that existed by the name of Polycarp? Have you ever heard of Polycarp? Anybody? In your studies? Rick has. Okay, Polycarp uh, is known and is famous in the Christian circles. And if you've done any uh, reading of historical Christianity, if you've read any of Josephus' writings or anything like that, you would have understood that Polycarp was actually a bishop or a pastor in the church at Smyrna. And what Polycarp is known for is that even though he was burned alive, he was faithful to Christ right until he drew his last breath. And he's, he's a very famous martyred Christian, if you will, in, in the historical account of Christianity. And so uh, Jesus is basically speaking specifically to, I believe, Polycarp and the rest of the congregation here. And he's saying, look, you're about ready to be really, really persecuted. But I want you to remain faithful even unto death. And I think that we can draw encouragement from that here in the world that we live in today. Now, praise God that the country that we live in still allows us to worship. Jared didn't show up with his uniform and his pistol to shut our worship down. We're not violating any laws here. And, and praise God for that. Okay? But do you realize that there are Christians all across the, the world who face that very threat? If they were caught meeting together publicly holding any kind of a worship service, truly they could be killed for their faith. And so when we think about the difficult times that we go through, when we think about uh, our hard times, let's draw strength and encouragement 
from, from scriptures like this. And let's realize that what we face really isn't that bad compared to what some of our brothers and sisters are facing uh, today in our, in our society. But he says, you know, he says, if you, if you are faithful, then he says, I will give you the crown of life. He says, then, he who has an ear, verse 11, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, who wants to come up here and, and give me a definition of what the second death is? Anybody? What is the second death? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want you to turn over in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. And I want you to go from chapter 2 and turn right over to chapter 20. Turn right on over to chapter 20. And we're going to read uh, quite a bit of scripture here. But I want you to get a picture of some of the reality of what our faith teaches. I want you to understand that there are real things that are going to be happening here, I believe in the very near future, that we can truly be thankful that we have the truth. I mean, there's some of this stuff. <clears throat> I know I don't want to be a part of it. Okay? And, and thank God that He has chosen to to give us His Son and to provide for us a way of salvation that we can avoid some of these things. But let's read a little bit and let's maybe remind ourselves of what we truly have to be thankful for. Book of Revelation, uh, chapter 20, let's just pick it right up here with verse 1. He says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. Now, the key to the abyss, what would, what would be the abyss that we'll be talking about here? A real place called hell. Okay? Eternal, everlasting punishment. That place where uh, those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior will unfortunately spend eternity. That's the way God has it set up. He says he has uh, the keys or the key to the abyss and he is holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. Now, what thousand years are we talking about? Does anyone know? The millennial reign of Christ. How many, when I say the millennial reign of Christ, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? In other words, we teach according to Scripture that Jesus literally will touch his feet down again at one point on the Mount of Olives. And at that point, he will return to earth and literally from Jerusalem, he will set up an earthly kingdom where he will reign for how long? A thousand years. Okay? During that time, what does it say is going to be happening to Satan? He'll be what? He'll be bound up according to this scripture and he will not be allowed to what during that time? Deceive. To deceive the nations. Who is Satan? He is the great deceiver. He is the chief of all liars. That is his quest in life is to deceive you into believing anything else but Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. Okay, so during this time, uh, Satan will be bound up and Christ will be in control until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And that, just, that was the end of verse 3. Here's verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Now, who do you suppose that would be? Who is going to be sitting on thrones given authority to assist Jesus Christ in carrying out his business of ruling and judging. Who do you suppose that will be? As I look around, my prayer is that many of you will be sitting on those thrones because these are those who would be part of what we would teach as the rapture of the church. We'll be raptured, 
will be caught up in the air to be with Jesus. And then it says, it teaches us that we will then reign with him during these thousand years. Okay? And then if we go on, and, and it says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. Now, who do you suppose those folks are being referred to? Who are those people? Who is it? Okay. Martyrs, and very specifically, people who are going to die during the Great Tribulation period. Okay? They're going to... The, he's, he's looking and he's seeing that those people also made it. Okay? Because they stayed faithful. Okay? Um, and, then, and it goes right on in the middle of this next verse here. Uh, he says, Who are these people? Um, because they died because of the testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. Reading right on, it says, They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So who will be reigning with Christ for a thousand years? Any of us who have believed during this age that we're now living in called the church age. Okay, you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ. You know that when you lay your head down on a pillow, you're not worried about where you're going for eternity. That issue has been settled. When the rapture takes place, you'll be risen up to be with the Lord. Okay? Can you still make it if you're alive during the tribulation period? I think there will be some that do, but they're going to have to pay with their very life. And it will be horrible. It will be a horrible time. So my my recommendation is don't wait. Get that issue settled now. Take care of it while grace is available to you. Okay? But reading on, he says in verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand year were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. And here's that term that we were going on search of. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So we've got all these new terms. The first resurrection is that part where... The dead in Christ will rise first. You can read all about it in 1 Thessalonians. And then those that are left will be caught up to be with Him in the air. The souls of those who died during the Great Tribulation, those are all people who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that is the first resurrection. Blessed are anybody who is able to take place in that first resurrection. Okay, and I'm not going into any details. I'm just giving you sort of an overview. But we still haven't really found out what the second death is. So let's keep reading. Verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sands on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. And where do we know is God's people? Where is the city that he loves? Who are God's people? It's Jerusalem. Okay, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. So the, 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 the great battle, you've heard the battle of Armageddon, it's, it's starting to form here. They're going to surround Jerusalem. And then it says all of a sudden, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And here we go. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So how long is eternity? Forever and ever. I mean, I'm telling you people, this is, this is serious business. 
This whole idea that Jesus came to offer us salvation is nothing to toy with. It is something to be received with great joy and saying, my God, thank you that we don't have to be concerned about this. Thank you for offering us this great salvation that we can have and, and avoid all of this stuff. Okay, But it still hasn't been real specific, so let's just keep reading. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Listen. I know that some of you have a great Christian heritage in your family. Your grandpa was a preacher. Maybe your daddy was a preacher. You know, you were raised to where you were in church for nine months before you were born and, and, and every year thereafter when you were in your mom and daddy's house. But bottom line, it's going to come down to there is no grandpa's coattails to ride on. You're not going to be admitted into heaven because your father or your mother was a great person. It boils down to that person that you look in the mirror every morning. What have you done with Jesus? Have you accepted Him as your personal Lord and Savior? Because listen, there is one way, one way and only one way for your name to be getting written down in that book. To be getting, to be written down in that book. And in what book are we talking about? That book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Remember the song? There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine how does my name get written down into that book you see the very instant that nanosecond that I say yes to God and I submit my sinful self to a holy God and I say yes I receive your forgiveness offered through your Son. And I'm putting my trust and my faith and my hope in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission and the forgiveness of my sins. That very instant when I receive that salvation, my name gets written in the book. And praise God, praise God, He uses permanent marker. Okay? Uh, once my name is written into the book, then, then you see, my deeds aren't going to be judged. God isn't going to use the great balancing scale. Well, let's see how you've done there, son. You did all these bad things, but boy, you got some good things, and ah, I guess they sort of balance themselves out. Eh, maybe we'll let him in. It's not how it works. There's going to be one book, and when your name is found, in that book of life, that's your entrance into heaven. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? That's how it works. Now, trust me, and, and we'll go into some of this sometime here in, in more teaching and preaching, but, but now there will be a judgment seat of Christ, and, and the Christians will give an account for how we did down here, but that has nothing to do with determining where we spend eternity. That only has to do with determining reward once we get there. It's like Bonnie. She's going to have lots of jewels in her crown because of stuff that she's had to put up with <clears throat> all these years. Now, I'm not going to go into any details, okay? 
you know, but you can use your imagination. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, so there, there is that kind of judgment that will go through, okay? And, and so, you know, when I get to that point in the process, I'm hoping that, that I'm doing well here and that I'll have something to show for, you know, my time as a pastor or as a, sa- as a saved person. But that's not what determines where I spend eternity. It's that book of life. Is your name in that book? That's the key. That is the key. And so as we read on, I have no idea where I am, but I'll figure it out. Let's just pick it up with verse 13. Are there demons in the sound system today? Okay, that's all right. Get thee behind me, Satan. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. And and let me add to that, not what he had done, whether or not there's enough good deeds, but it's, listen, it's the same question that Pilate asked. Remember? In In the trial, and Pilate said, look, I find no fault with this man. I've looked at it and he says, you know, I find no basis for a charge against this man. And, and the people, crucify him, crucify him, you know. And in the John rendering of that whole story, I, I just love the question. Pilate says, what then shall I do with this Jesus? And see, that's the question that if you get the wrong answer, It will haunt you for all eternity. What have you done with this Jesus? Have you accepted Him? Have you based your life upon Him? Have you received Him with joy and gladness in your heart? Or have you said, you know what, preacher? Uh, Thanks, but no thanks. Maybe another time. And you're the only one that truly knows the answer to that question. My prayer is that, man, you've accepted them and and this is a done deal and, and you're just like, yes, man, that's me. That is me. That is me. Yes, yes, yes. I don't want you to miss that. So if we read on in verse 14, we see, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, Oh, here we go. Here's our definition that we've been searching for this whole time. What is the second death? The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, just in case you were wondering, just in case you got confused and you thought maybe there were some things that you were supposed to do that you didn't do, and oh my goodness, maybe I'm going to miss it, he goes right back and he reminds you How do you miss the second death? Your name must be written in the book of life. And he said, verse 15, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That, my friends, is the second death. And so back to our scripture in verse 11 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, how do we overcome? Accepting Christ. Christ. There's only one way. Jesus said it. I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. How many people are going to get to God the Father except through Jesus? No one will come to the Father except through me. Jesus has called himself the gate. He said, I am the door. He is the only way. And so, when you have overcome and you have taken care of that issue, then look at what it says. What a promise. What a phenomenal thing to be able to wrap your mind around and to be able to grab a hold of with everything you are and say, you know what? I can take this to the bank. This is a phenomenal promise. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. 
all of this stuff about end times and about Satan and about, oh man, the white throne judgment, all this stuff, man, it can cause fear and anxiety and, and you get to hearing about it. That's why some churches don't ever preach about it because, hey, you know, we don't want to offend anybody, you know. Uh, we're just going to avoid all that sin stuff. We're just going to talk about warm, fuzzy things, happy things. We have nothing to fear. It should be a great cause of joy deep down in our souls to know that God loved us enough that He gave us His only Son. That whosoever believes in Him shall not, what? Perish. What's perish? Get the second death. It has no power over us. Praise God. I don't want you to miss it. So, uh, you know, wherever you are, I mean, I have to believe that I would really love to believe that everyone that is occupying pew space here has already taken care of this issue. But I am not naive enough to understand that in a crowd this size there may be a couple. There may be someone sitting here. You might have heard this a thousand times but right now the Holy Spirit of God is, is, is just like for whatever reason He's got your attention. It's like all of a sudden, you know, man, he starts talking about this stuff. I don't know. Let me tell you, if you haven't settled the issue of your soul, Shelly is going to come up here and we're going to sing a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. Listen, you need to be able to sing that as your own testimony. Is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? If He is, praise God. Then sing that and, and, and praise the Lord. But if you can't sing that as your own personal praise, then there's some business that you need to transact with God. And you know, I am never one that wants to embarrass anyone or call anybody out and make a spectacle of anything. But I'm going to tell you, there are two pews, the big one here and the big one right there, that are empty. If you would like to come up and pray, if you would like to come up and settle this issue, if you would like to get your name written down in that book, I can show you how through God's Word. And then you can pray and you can put your belief and your trust in what God's Word teaches. And if that's you this morning, man, I invite you while we're singing, you come up here and I will come down and we'll pray and we will settle this issue once and for all. So as we stand and sing, I want you to know that you're invited. And you know what? Maybe you're just struggling right now. Maybe you were connecting a little bit more with the first part of this scripture. Maybe you feel like you're part of the persecuted church because stuff in your life is just, wow, I, man, it's hard right now. It's just difficult. There's just so much stuff going on. Maybe you just need to come up and pray and, and ask God to, to send a little bit more encouragement. So I invite you, wherever you are today, you come up and you spend a little time in prayer. And you know what? Um, I always say it this way. Jesus hung on a cross publicly for me. Once in a while it doesn't hurt me to come up and publicly spend some time praying. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So Shelley's going to lead us. And as God has spoken to you, you come up and pray. And uh, we'll have a good time of, of prayer. And then we'll be done for today. So let's sing. Where is
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we can sing a song like this about uh, being transported up into the clouds to be with you, Lord, and we can believe it in our hearts and know that it's true because your word says so. Father, I pray for each one who is here. Lord, in the difficulties of life, may you be faithful to provide us with encouragement and Lord, I pray that if someone here does not know you as their Savior, that Lord, you would knock upon the door of their mind and their heart. Make yourself real to them and let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this salvation is for them. Lord, I pray that as we go, that we'll take the name of Jesus with us, that we'll be light and salt. Lord, in the short time that we have left here on this earth, that will help as many people find Jesus as we can possibly do. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you.